What is going on everybody? Welcome back to the Style of Gaming. As always, thank you for joining me here as we share a passion for games and video game art. If you like what we're doing on this channel, please show us some love by hitting that subscribe button, like this video, or comment below. I'm always looking to reach out with our viewership to revel in gaming. But let's get into what everyone is here for, the full style review of Guacamelee 2. Guacamelee 2 was released by Drinkbox Studio on August 21st, 2018 for PS4 and PC. This game is a sequel to the studio's 2013 breakout title Guacamelee that followed the story of Juan Aguacate, an agave farmer made luchador superhero figure who sought to save the Mexiverse from the evil Kalaka. Guacamelee 2, following in its predecessor's foot footsteps, is a Metroidvania-style action platformer that combines precise and exciting gameplay with a witty, tongue-in-cheek narrative of timeline and dimension travel to save the world that delivers at every corner. With the house cleaning addressed and my postcard description given, let's dive into the nitty gritty and unbox this game. Guacamelee 2 picks up right at the defeat of Kalaka, the Charo who captures El Presidente's daughter and threatens to merge the land of the living and dead to rule them both. The game has you experience a very watered down version of the final fight as the prologue to the journey ahead. Juan in Guacamelee 2 is enjoying the post hero life as we see him living with his wife, Lupita, and his two children. The story kicks off with Lupita requesting Juan to get avocados for her guacamole. On his mission, crimson-sided portals begin bursting in the sky engulfing Juan's town when we are introduced to the game's antagonist, Salvador. Salvador is a luchador who has come from a different moment in time known as the Darkest Timeline for an ancient relic to help him find and consume the ancient guacamole that will give him immense strength. Salvador is praised by those around him for his superb technique and physical capabilities as he is also the slayer of Kalaka, for the Juan and Tostada of Salvador's timeline failed. Salvador is being guided by the evil Ue Peck, the antithesis of the game's protagonist guide Ue Chivo. The Ue Chivo being the different goat human characters who offer you power in both Guacamelee 1 and 2. Salvador wears a luchador mask that is draining his life, and the ancient guac being his only salvation, he descends into depravity to achieve his survival and ultimately, true strength and power. While in the darkest timeline, Juan must meet up with his old partner Tostada in order to find the luchador mask that once gave him the incredible abilities to stop Kalaka. Through a series of trials with anthropomorphic animals and plants, dimension and time travel, chicken transformation, and memes, Juan ultimately confronts Salvador and his minions through a series of hilarious and incredibly epic moments that culminates to a hilarious and climactic end. Guacamelee 2's story is one that is both ridiculous and serious all at the same time, and within minutes of diving in, I knew I felt that the sequel was justified. I mean, within moments, you might be handling a menacing scenario, but the game immediately just brings you down with some ridiculous joke, hilarious narrative twist, or fourth wall break that genuinely had me laughing from start to finish. If you saw my Let's Play, I was bursting out just, just consistently. I could not stop myself. I found myself engrossed with the witty gaming or pop culture references littered all over the billboards and walls of the major cities in Guacamelee 2. If you're like me, you'll find yourself laughing at the awesome retro throwbacks or incredibly well thought out references to games and gaming gripes in the community. I'm looking at you, there's one born every minute trophy. If you guys don't know what that is, go ahead and go watch my part five of our Let's Play of Guacamelee 2. Hilarious. Lifestyle games on attack. <laughs> I don't want to give away or spoil some of those awesome moments, but I never thought I'd play a turn based uh, version of Guacamelee. It was something else. This game is packed with epic story content that handles a serious matter like the end of the universe and handles it with such a joking attitude and ease. One moment for me that sticks out is when Tostada is afraid for the end of the universe. Uh, Juan basically just jumps into the air and throws a victory arm post and she responds, you always know just what to say. <laughs> it just, it's moments like this where the, the writing staff knows that the, the story that they are delivering was absolutely absurd. Does it make it less of a gimmick though when you recognize it's absolutely a gimmick? Uh, Guacamelee 2 made me reevaluate my answer with some of the most absolutely absurd fourth wall breaks. 
I showed up for the gameplay because I loved Guacamelee 1 and was given a truly captivating and fun story that didn't disappoint. Now that we've covered the story, let's go ahead and talk about some of the gameplay and the relevant artistic elements and directions that we really like to discuss here on the channel. As I was talking about earlier, what a justified sequel. I was concerned that I'd find myself playing the same game in a different setting, uh, because Guacamelee 2 resurrects the flawless combat and traversal system of its predecessor, but adds just enough new spice to really make things exciting and remain fresh. I picked this game up, and it felt just like the first. That may sound like a bad thing, but I let, just hear me out. The first Guacamelee offered a tight system of controls that helped hardcore players achieve the near-perfect expectations uh, that some of the more hardened challenge required of you, but offered a comprehensive mapping that helped nestle white players into feeling capable and badass all the same. So why break a system that worked incredibly? Drinkbox answered that and said we won't. Uh, keeping it in line with the first Guacamelee, Guacamelee 2 uses basic bu button schemes in a, in a complicated way by combining timing with a series of single button and directional based options for Wands power attacks and for your Poyo powers. Perfect example, it's similar to uh, Super Smash Brothers with smash attacks. You've got your up circle, you've got your left and right circle, you've got down circle and then ultimately you'll be given left or right triangle or up and down triangle, but that's augmented by uh, dimension traversal with R2, turning into the chicken with L1, and having to use those with precise navigation and precise timing. It, uh, it really adds for a complicated system in a seemingly simple game. But they only improved the mechanics and closed the room for error for hardcore fans in Guacamelee 2. I mean, some of the challenge rooms in this game were incredibly challenging. I found myself rinse and repeating certain traversal rooms because the margin of error was tiny and I refused to let it beat me. I, that's just who I am. I'm a trophy hunter at heart. And I think that's what's exciting about this iteration. Uh, if you only want a killer story, follow the main path and you'll be all right. You want a serious challenge? Well, they definitely reward you for doing so. Every time I struggled, that health piece, stamina piece, new power, tons of money, really wiped the minor agitation right off my face. This game combines a basic mapping and pushes the player to use the basic mechanics in excellently timed fashion for high intensity, fast paced platforming and fighting. Guacamelee 2 delivers in every way that its predecessor did, but only advances it even better, more thrilling, more exciting, get into it. Whoop some ass, be a badass luchador. In terms of graphics, Guacamelee 2 took a big leap into a beautiful direction with Drinkbox's new and refined gameplay engine. Um, I'm not really quite sure what that engine is. I tried to do some research, but it is confirmed that they are using a new and refined engine for this game. As I was, but as I was traveling through each of the intricately craft levels, I found myself stopping and just gazing at the details bursting all around me. From the 3D map environments juxtaposed to the 2D backgrounds, the unique and volumetric light synchronicity, and the highly fluid and responsive textures, I couldn't get over how busy and beautiful this game was. In terms of Guacamelee 2, busy is much better. One of the first things that I have to address is the iconography in the game. The team at Drinkbox really brought the Mexilur the Mexilurse, the Mexiverse to life by staying true to the cultural heritage of its source material. Mexican and South American art has always had this way of um, imbuing cultural ideas into the highly bold and colorful representations through, seen through their artistic history. In terms of historic Mesoamerican art, ideas about daily life, family, and heritage were expressed through dramatic relief, through pottery, textile creation, but most specifically building ornamentation. And this notion has carried on for decades now as many artists imbue everyday life and its complexities into their bold and colorful art styles that merge the lines of contemporary realism with bold geometric patterns and highly noticeable color sch schemes that still elicit the social and cultural voice of the art that the region has always retained. Even further, these ideas and Mexican representation blur the line of art exclusively for a living audience, but present the idea that art and music can invoke and facilitate our loved ones from beyond. And Drinkbox echoes this concept throughout the narrative and art direction of this game. 
I opened with iconography because the symbols and totems and icons used in this game are not direct translations from real world art, but um, you can absolutely uh, see like the inspirations. They are so transparent and so recognizable that uh, you can just tell that this group did their research on iconography to really invoke the sensation and the feeling that uh, the Mexiverse should have from their source material. The color palettes used in both the world of the living and the dead invoke the reflective but celebratory nature of Dio de los Muertos. And you guys, I, I can't get over the mix of cool and warm hues as the purples and oranges just dance with the red and blues in this game. Every aspect from the costumes to ornamentation, it all has a place and was clearly thought about while it was crafted. I found myself just periodically switching between worlds so I could see how a certain background looked or how the Land of the Dead's interpretation might be. I mean, when you're at the, infern in the Inferno, uh, you can't actually see hell when you're in the Land of the Living. It's just a spry and bursting forest. I mean, there, there's so many intricacies and so many nuances in the art direction from down to just the basic particle systems as you're, you know, you see the butterflies and just kind of like the floating life or just, you know, the the heat from the magma that particle systems just add a, a great level of detail without being overburdensome or just the light reflecting from the geometric jade gold hybrid of a temple block. I mean, this game delivers one of the most refined and beautiful platformers I've experienced in a while, especially when looking at the Metroidvania-style platforming action game. I think one of the coolest and most unique things are the variations of ads and Easter eggs based on um, the living and the dead worlds. It's small and probably easy to do for the developers, but this level of detail is the kind of thing that always brings me back to a game developer like Drinkbox. It's just these small nuances that they're like, you know what? That's a, that's a pretty in, uh, environment that we rendered. What can we do to just like add subtle ornamentation from this point? How can we imbue ideas into our game? And they're just perfect. And you know that that segues me, uh, you know, perfectly into one of my favorite aspects of gaming. One of the I feel one of the most overlooked aspects of gaming, which is the music. Now. Uh, Peter Chapman, Ram DiPrisco, and the Mariachi Entertainment System were the general composition for Guacamelee 2. Um, you can actually go on to their Bandcamp from Drinkbox's website and you can listen to the whole soundtrack if you just happen to kind of blur it as you were playing, but go back and listen to it. It is incredible because it is one of the best game soundtracks I've heard in a long time. Not only has the music been carefully crafted to invoke the sensation of the story, uh, like the different moments that you're feeling it, I, I sometimes find myself playing games where it's supposed to be a really calm moment, but the music is really intense, and it just kind of throws me off, but I feel like the highs and the lows of the album really capture the highs and lows of the story. But, um... The com it, 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 it echoes the combat and the traversal, uh, the traversal scenarios. It, it's perfect. It's a soundtrack I found myself just jamming to. I would just stop and be like, ooh, and just moving my shoulders, moving my shoulders, just like getting down because it was genuinely groovy. It feels like the game offers a solid reward of justified badassitude when completing a sweet part by a bursting flamenco solo or a retro flare trickle that just seems to appreciate the time that the player put in. It's just a, it's an awesome sound reward and the, the sound profiles in the game are excellent too. And all the sounds fit, nothing seems out of place, there's nothing too quiet or low, uh, nothing unique like I didn't expect it to be there. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I didn't ha hear any, like, unique, you know, Foley sounds or anything like that. And that's okay, but this game didn't need to. But, you know, as you're trudging through water, you've got your... It sounded moist, you know, as you're running up the wall, the clack of, you know, Juan's shoes, like, a, you know, kind of hitting that pavement, that hard sound. It was, it was just a... Um, it was just overall a good sound profile. But, um... Composers Peter Chapman and Ram DiPrisco 
uh, the tracks in the game are just uh, really awesome, but I've got to give it to Marian Mariachi Entertainment Systems. Um, even though they're only credited on a few songs, there's one song particularly that got to me, which was a uh, la. Uh, now bear with me, La Tragedia de Salvador. Uh, that del it, it just delivers a unique sound for the game that was both inspire inspiring and somber. And I don't want to give away too many moments because it really was powerful. And it just, it, it elucidates everything that I'm talking about in this game. It was very serious and it just like ends on this like hilarious note. But it's the it's the time where like the, the, the Holy Mother basically delivers you the message. Not the Holy Hen about Salvador, like what happened, you know, his upbringing. And it was just a beautiful moment. And I think that's what gets me amped for this game, um, you know, is just such an excellent soundtrack. I know I'm gonna be ripping as I'm playing, but this game takes it to the next level because there's different iterations of the tracks you're listening to in the living and the dead worlds. They're subtly different. Like, you have to really be paying attention, but it's, it's these nuances that really stick out in such a saturated market like gaming. Uh, uh, honestly, like, you really have to do something that's unique or something so small and nuanced that so many people get behind, and these are the kinds of things that I can get behind. But the visualization and the sound profiles, they really want to engross you with, I'm in the land of the living, I'm in the land of the dead, and I love that. But uh, beyond that, I mean, I can. Th this is one of us. This is a soundtrack that I can actually like name titles. I mean, the track uh, Los Mangarares, which is also one of the areas. Um, I, I love the funky groove of the bass. There's just like the excellent trumpet that goes on. But honestly, there's just like this trill of like a retro arcade flutter that's just like kind of like in conjunction to like the awesome instrumentation I just mentioned that just, it gave me chills every time I played the game. Just excellent soundtrack. All in all, Guacamelee 2 delivers an exciting facelift to an excellent formula drink boxes concocted. This game is exciting and fresh and only improves on the groundwork its predecessor laid. The action is non-stop with combat as fluid and clean as can be. The story of Juan only deepens as you hurl your fists through the vibrant and beautiful worlds of the Mexiverse's sprawling timelines. The soundtrack and visuals provide a, vi a visual audio feast as you sit back and enjoy the wit and the hilarity of the writing team. Guacamelee 2 would be a 10 out of 10 if I did a quantitative metric. So you guys already know my answer to if you should play this game or not. It is an absolute must for any Metroidvania puzzle platformer fans. It is, it is digital and available now, and you're missing out big if you pass this title up. Don't be like me and let this series go overlooked. When I picked up the Super Turbo Championship edition of Guacamelee 1, I just was thrust into this universe, and I knew I'd love it from that point on. Here we are now, five years later, and loving it. Pick up Guacamelee 2 right now on PS4 and on Steam. Thank you guys for joining me for our full style review of Guacamelee 2. As always, if you like this content, please like and subscribe. We've extended the last days to subscribe for our Spider-Man giveaway. We did that by three days. Tell your friends if you're watching, subscribe, get another entry. Stay tuned for September 4th with Destiny 2 Forsaken. And of course, of course, of course, stay tuned for Friday, September 7th, as we become the style of Spider-Man as Spider-Man takes over this channel. But until then, take care, everyone.